spirituality and religion. So, spirituality is a very hot topic these days. It's been a hot topic, I would say, since about 2021. Of course, it's always been a hot topic. If we look at Bobby Hemet in the 1980s and earlier, and we look at other people who have done these multi-hour lectures and they've talked at great length for hours in lecture halls and other meeting areas, and they have not just years, but they have decades, decades of sharing spiritual insight with people. So what I want to look at today is this idea of spirituality and being woke as well as religion. And if you allow me, I want to go deep in on this. I really want to go deep on this. So, spirituality to me at its fundamental level is about connection with nature. Nature can take the form of, and it does take the form of, trees, ground, leaves, air, water, fire, earth itself, the cosmos, stars, what we call as physical that you can put your hands on or in some way touch, whether it's with your hands or with a tool, because your hands are not going to touch fire, but you can touch fire with a metal rod or with a stick, right? So it is for the stars in the sky where you can build a machine that can go to another star system or to some planet and to the sun itself or at least approach the sun close enough, close enough to pick up some information. But that's still contact, even though it's contact at a distance. And so spirituality As we understand it in the human experience, we generally trace it back to what they call animism. Animism is the most ancient belief in deities and power that comes out of the earth and out of physical things itself. And you can understand life. You can understand existence. You can understand the totality of what's going on by tapping into the earth, to the soil, to trees and bushes, and observing and understanding animals and plants and flowers by really understanding the rhythms of streams and rivers and seas and lakes by looking at the mountain and how different phenomena roll down and roll up the mountain. Maybe an ibex, maybe a group or troop of monkeys. How different creatures move about these different landscapes. How different insects and different kinds of uh, flowers and uh, plant species and reptiles and amphibians, you name it. Basically, when you can understand these patterns between things or among things and draw a deeper observation, an observation that cannot even be captured by words, whether we're talking about Zosa in ancient Africa or English in the present day. No words that you will form or structure will capture the entirety of what you can feel and understand within yourself. 
However, we can use words and we can use language to create a bridge between where we are within us and our observations and what we seek to connect to that we observe outside of ourselves. Okay, so that is a very rough and very compact summary of spirituality in the human experience. In the human experience. That is about a compact and short summary as you're going to get. And so when we look at the evolution of spirituality, how does, how does spirituality like that evolve? It goes in a couple of directions. One direction is the oral tradition and the somewhat semi-oral tradition in a way where we talk about you know, drawings inside the interior of a cave. Or we have landmarks that we call landmarks that were etched onto the surface of the grass. Rings, there might be rings on the surface of the grass in parts of Africa or parts of what we call Britain. And these rings, they may be made of stone, They may be made of something else. We see other types of structures that are put up, that are brought up, right? And these structures are part of the documentation of spirituality. It's a form of documentation. Or at least that's how we can interact with them. Because we're, we're, we are not there when, this, when these structures were brought up. Okay? So, when we see that spirituality that is more what you call organic. An organic spirituality. Which we all see today. Where you're following your intuition. You're following your instincts. You're following a inner muse that guides you towards a truth that resonates within you on what you do, how you speak, what you participate in, what you avoid. And this can take the form of casting away negative energy and working towards manifesting in positive energy. Okay? So, that's one form of spirituality. That's one path. An organic path. And that is what we call woke. The true definition of woke is organic spirituality that is in contrast to highly structured spirituality. So that brings me to a second path, a path of spirituality that has some structure to it, but it is not so strict in its guidance that you would be excommunicated if you deviated from that path. For example, say you were a self-declared Buddhist or you were a self-declared initiate of a mystery school or maybe not even self-declared. Maybe there's a group of people who have initiated you into a tradition. Now, can you check their paperwork and know if they can trace their initiation to the first creators of that particular path? Well, who's to say? But more or less, you are in a um, somewhat quasi-structured path where you're still giving a, given a wide liberty to go your own way or to at least stay in alignment with a certain path, a certain group, but do it in a way 
that where you can do your own thing a little bit as long as you don't deviate too far to where it's unrecognizable, where someone can say, well, I no longer recognize that as uh, Obia or Yoruba or Buddhism or Taoism or, you know, yogic, um, Himalayan yogic practice, you know? So that's, that's one, one here. And so that first path, that organic spiritual path, sometimes, and when we talk about what we call today's woke perspective, can, it does often feed off of that second path, that unstru- you will see a lot of echoes of Buddhism, Taoism, Qigong, Reiki energy healing, and many other paths that don't have a strict dogmatic prescription for how you behave, how you conduct, how you do this or that, how you bow, how you pray. Those those, um, instructions exist in those paths, right? But they are not enforced to such a strict level that people are called out and ex- excommunicated or kicked out of the group, so to speak, you know, except in the most, um, you know, uh, severe instances of malconduct and misconduct. But the thing is, what we call woke has drawn, has, it did, a lot of woke did not source its expression purely from animism. Shamanic animism is as pure as it gets. It's as pure pure as it gets. But a lot of shamanic animism is undocumented. Greatly undocumented. So what you have in terms of what you can read and what you can study is, for the most part, the second path of quasi-structured spirituality that is also, in some cases, religion. But then that takes us to the third path, right? That third path is religion, what we call religion. And when we say religion in the West, religion in the West has a different connotation than the objective term religion. Religion in the West means a strict doctrine, but it also means that in some parts of what we would call the East from the Western perspective. So it means a spiritual system that follows a very strict code of conduct, a code of behavior, a code of practice, a way of conducting the spirituality. You... In most cases, you're going to assemble, mainly in a building. You're going to assemble somewhere in a gathering. You're going to learn from a group in a very structured way. And it's not always that everyone in their religion goes to a school, but you're going to get books, and these books are going to introduce you and guide you through how you conduct yourself in that particular spiritual tradition. So, for example, Islamic paths have books and have practices that are enforced by and large, and you don't really have very many what you would call off-the-rails Muslims. You just don't. Most Muslims that you're going to meet are going to follow the Islamic doctrine and path in a very particular way. There are behavioral patterns for most Muslims where you're going to know, okay, yeah, that person is definitely a Muslim. The same for Christians, whether Baptist, Catholic, Methodist. There are certain behavioral patterns where even if the person isn't like what you would call a perfect Christian or someone who like, um, or someone who uh, 
takes liberties with their Christianity to, you know, have a little fun or to gain a little power or gain a little money, whatever you might say, cut corners here and there uh, in the workplace primarily or in other parts of life. Anyway, there's still going to be some kind of blueprint in their life and the way they conduct themselves where you're going to say, yeah, that's definitely a Christian. That's definitely a Christian. And it's the same with certain um, forms of Buddhism, right? Certain forms of Buddhism is like that. Um, There's a person that if they follow a more strict version of Buddhism and they're part of a Buddhist community, they're going to talk a certain way and conduct themselves a certain way. And it's even the same with people who follow a certain certain uh, yogic practices. Right. So that's that third path. Right. Of spirituality. Now, the thing is, is that that takes us to the next part of this, and that is spirituality of the organic and semi structured kind versus religion or highly structured spirituality. So, the problem that people have with highly structured spirituality, not the least of which that it can feel very confining, but the very first step for a person to exit and find themselves where they self-select themselves out of a religious practice, whether it be Christianity, Islam, or something of that variety, right? And there's others that that, that I could mention as well. But a a person might self-select themselves out of that, at least in the Western world, because they may find or have a sense that the spiritual growth that they envision or that they can sense within themselves, they feel that it is not adequately treated or addressed by that structured spiritual path that is called religion. So, for example, a person may go to a Christian church and they may pray and they may study and they may worship, but they feel like their questions about morality, about truth, about ascension into heaven after death, they may find that the answers that they get, the answers that they pose, now, they may pose those questions in a couple of ways because it's not always safe or socially acceptable to pose those questions verbally. Okay? Okay? So they may go online and they may do a search. And these days they may use generative AI to work, to work through a line of questioning. Uh, so this happens privately. This happens anonymously. This happens in a way that's safe where they just start doing some study. They start doing some research. They may go to social media and They might go to a place like TikTok that has these very short videos that can like rapid fire information into your mind where it's like there are questions you have and you find content that answers, starts to answer those questions for you or at least put you down a road that is more productive than what you are experiencing trying to ask somebody a question in person in your Christian faith experience that you oftentimes have to go through contortions of speech. You have to go through contortions in order to ask certain questions but not ask them in a way where people are going to reject you, kick you out of the church, or otherwise um, socially ostracize you or uh, turn a cold shoulder to you. You have to be careful in some cases. And so, you know, you spend your life from, in some cases, young childhood or young adulthood all the way up until your 30s, in some cases 40s, and you've got these questions and you can't get them answered adequately 
there are answers, but there's just a gap between the answer you're getting where it's like, yeah, ultimately this is what it is and you either take it or leave it. In most cases, you have to take it. You can't, you know, you can't just leave it. You have to take it. And it's like, you, you, so really you want more. You want more. And the message that you might get is you got to control your expectations. You got to put your expectations in a bottle. You will hear that in many variations or many forms. Put your expectations in a bottle. You're, you're wanting too much. And, you know, in a more enlightened dialogue, it may be, it's okay to want these things, but you're wanting them too much too fast. And you just need to be patient and it's going, going to come to you. It's going to come to you. But meanwhile, you see that there are answers out there. And so you're like, you know what? <clears throat> for, for many, it's like they get to a point where they're like, there are answers out there. There are, there are actual, well-studied, well-thought-through, well-thought-out discussions that have taken place on these questions over thousands of years. And I don't say that with any exaggeration. I'm saying literally thousands of years, not, not 2,000 years. No, not 2,000 years. Not even 4,000 years. I am talking about like 10,000 years. 20,000 years. You know how long 10,000 years is? Man, that's a long time. 10 freaking thousand years is a long time for people to work through certain questions and figure some things out. When this, is, when this is mathematics and when this is science, we would say 10,000 is greater than 2,000. You put a greater than sign right there in the middle. 10,000 is greater than 2,000. So you can't really... And, and 10,000 and 20,000 is greater than even 6,000, right? And I'm talking about that 6,000 where the greater part, the greater part of that 6,000... That's on the right-hand side of the equation. The greater part of that is still a figuring out phase. On the left-hand side of that equation, where you're talking about 10,000 and 20,000 in some cases, the greater part of that time frame is more in the majority of that time period. So what I'm saying there is there is far less time figuring out in the more ancient paths and practices that are out there than you're going to see on the right-hand side of that equation where it's 2,000 or 6,000, okay? So you don't need anybody to explain that to you, though. You don't need anybody to explain that to you. Because it's like this, when something has more substance and more weight and more quality and more ingredient in it, you know it. You know it when you see it, you know it when you eat it, you know it when you drink it, you know it when you contact it, you can feel it. You're like, you ever picked up something that was like handmade and it had like all this uh, gold or brass or copper in it and some nice uh, wood and it was really well made and you had this other thing that was plastic. I'm telling you, you touch that thing that's made of all that nice metal and that nice uh, uh, wood and it's well crafted and you just pick it up. Now maybe it's not the most uh, practical utilita utilitarian thing in the world right compared to the plastic thing but it is great. You know there's something that's gone into it, especially if it's something that's from like way back in the day. It might be 200 or 300 years old, this handcrafted thing, whereas this plastic thing was just made like uh, four months ago. And so it's like that's what you see when you get that spiritual information from these other sources. And so people want to know where this woke came from. 
people simply found out the phone was ringing and they found out it was like it's time to wake up because what was on the other line side of the line was something from way way back and what it was was substance and it was the exact same substance that long story short some of the religion that you see well not some of all all of the religion that you see is actually based off of but you end up finding that the religion is watered down version of the original the people don't want the watered down like i was talking about with the plastic versus the handmade um, item made out of fine metal and wood People might be satisfied with that in the beginning, and when they're babies growing up into adults, that may be all they know, but once they get access to the real thing, they're like, hmm, I like this a whole lot better. And so it's hard, it's actually hard to go back into religion once you've had that exposure. So I'm going to tell you a little secret, something that I discovered. And if you made it this far, you know, you might find this interesting. Okay, because I'm not actually finished with this discussion, I got a little bit more say on this, but I just wanted to stop here and and put something in here that I actually found out. And I've told many people this face to face, but I've never said it in this forum or in this platform. And that is, I, I've done a um, I've done a fair amount of religious study. Part of what I've done in my own background, in my own life is I've done a lot of study in religion as well as philosophy, but mostly religion. I've done a uh, 10,000 hours. I've done about 10,000 hours of religious study. I'm not talking about what I've been exposed to from childhood into um, you know, adulthood, right? Um, I don't count that. That's just automatic stuff. I'm talking about where I actually did scholarship myself. When I did my own scholarship. Okay? Because, you know, like many people, you get exposed to things, but I don't count that as actual substantive knowledge. That's just autopilot indoctrination, right? But I built off of that, and I went and did my own research Mainly because I wanted to deepen at the time my own faith, my own understanding, right? And I was building into a Christ consciousness. And I learned all the mechanics of Christ consciousness. I don't teach that anymore, but I understand and I have understood how a person reaches Christ consciousness. It's very powerful. It's a real thing, okay? But I learned something else along the way. As I was doing this deep scholarly research, right, and anybody who does a study in what's called Christian apologetics, as well as uh, Christian history, and you understand and learn about the foundations of Christendom, and you, um, you just go into all kinds of material, there, at least most of what I read was not produced by what you would call lay people. I, I didn't read a lot from lay people, what is called lay people. Just about everything I read in life, the things that I study, I am going to um, put priority on materials that are from PhDs for, for good or bad. That's how I do it. I, I, I want authoritative sources. I don't want opinions for the most part. Because the way I look at it, I know how PhDs get their PhDs. I know the rigors they go through. So, you know, it's not that PhDs are always right, okay? But you you got to give it to somebody that spends so many years and put so much into really understanding something, and then extra bonus points if they can communicate it well, well enough where you can understand it from their point of view as a 
student and scholar um, who has now um, put it all together because I don't have that kind of time. So if I can if I can get a PhD from Liberty University or from the Vatican or from you know um, Orthodox uh, Greek Orthodox wherever you know because I survey across the field you know um, if I can get their insights and it can save me time even though I have to invest time into what they're writing then I'm like okay this is going to be very useful to me right. Because they had to spend 15 years, in some cases, researching thousands of documents to see connections and draw conclusions. Imagine doing that for 15 years. And then you have a person like me, all I have to do is just read their book. And it may take me a week, two weeks to read their book. And then I can form conclusions on top of the conclusions they've already formed. But their conclusions were well thought out. They may not be foolproof, but they're better than me making up something and imagining something, right? So imagine me reading hundreds of these books. They, they're reading thousands as an individual, as an individual. So they're reading thousands of books. So let's say I've read several hundred books from different PhDs, okay? So it's like using generative AI in today's world. I'm getting a translation that is of great quality, right? Now we can do sidebars on is is generative AI good quality, but we know those human researchers are. Okay, so then it's like, this is what I'm getting to. I noticed something in some of what I had studied. And that is that when I started seeing some of the layers in the understanding from some of these, uh, how, do you, how do you address them? Um, I don't want to say cardinals and bishops and um, expert scholars and all this. I kind of want to just use one term. Um, these, do, let's just call them um, doctors of theology. Yes, okay. So I noticed when I looked at the layers of knowledge that was starting to become visible from these doctors of theology, I noticed something. I noticed quite a few of them, not all, but quite a few of them, enough of them to um, at least have an impact on me gained a, some of their inspiration from Eastern religion, Eastern practices, and actual Eastern practitioners. And without citing examples, because if I, I know that if I cite examples, this entire discussion will become much more controversial than it needs to be. And that's not really what I'm trying to do. My, my whole purpose here is to express and explain something that I see in a general sense, okay? That's what I am doing, is I'm explaining spirituality in the three paths. Animism, or raw spirituality and wokeness, and then that second path of semi-structured spirituality and what we're talking about now, which is religion. What I've seen with religion in Christianity is I've seen inspiration taken from Eastern practitioners. So I'll be somewhat more specific here without uh, stirring controversy. At least that's my attempt. The Dalai Lama from Tibet has definitely influenced Christian scholars in the West. That is a fact. I can prove it, but I'm not going to prove it in this dialogue. And I don't have to. If anybody researches 
Christian apologetics and Christian theological commentary and Christian doctrinal papers written by certain individuals, you will find the cross connection there. Anyway, um, so the Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama, who I have actually done some research on, and my, my kickoff for, for that was I, I, liked, I liked the movie Kundun. I liked the movie Kundun, and I got curious. I was like, whatever happened to that kid turned Dalai Lama in uh, depicting that movie by Martin Scorsese? I have that movie on DVD, and I used to watch it a lot. And I was like, who is that? Who is that? What are they about? So that sent me down a huge rabbit hole where I just started studying it and studying it and studying it. And so then I just filed all that information away. Anyway, so then um, there's another person I want to bring up. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, who exited uh, this reality, I believe, in 2022. And I've read a few of his books. He actually helped me make some shifts in my thinking. Um, the quality, the quality of my emotional thinking, was greatly assisted by some of his writings. Uh, some of his writings, it's a masterpiece in human psychology, and the self manipulation of your own psychology towards what we would call a right hand path. Titch not Han in my opinion, has the best books on that. But he as an individual, him, in his younger incarnation, in his 20s, directly influenced, not intentionally, but he directly influenced in the 7, 19, the late 1960s, 1970s, 19, early 1980s, he has directly influenced certain individuals, both in the U.S. Civil Rights Movement, but also in uh, certain Christian religious communities, of which there were, there were communities that had an outsized influence on Christian thought in the 1970s and early 1980s. I'm talking about liberal Christianity because there is a such thing as liberal Christianity and what's called conservative Christianity, which has the undertones of fundamentalist Christianity. That's a deep rabbit hole there. But anyway, so then, um, so you have those two individuals there, right? And when I started doing my research on that, I drew a conclusion. I drew a conclusion. I said, if these individuals have influenced Christianity this much, not all of Christianity, but at least that slice of Christianity that I was starting to interact with, more, I use the term liberal versus conservative. The majority of my, uh, f my friends and colleagues in Christianity, they were liberal. The, the majority, you know. Um, it, ju it just is what it is. And so I was like, you know what? And, and they were unaware of this uh, indirect influence. And I, never, I have never made them aware of it. I've never had this conversation with them. Right, because it, it really went down like this. I was part of a book club, a Christian book club, and we would exchange books and we exchange um, insights on certain certain liter literature, certain certain um, certain books, right? And we'd meet like once a month, or maybe once a quarter, one or the other. And I did this for a couple of years. All right, so here's the thing. I saw some books. Uh, 
one of the titles was um, Why Not Be a Mystic, for example, by Frank Tuati. Um, I don't think you can get it in print anymore. Okay. Um, there were s- several from a gentleman named uh, Anthony DeMello, uh, for example. Um, I, I'm just going to put those two out there, but there were so many. And if you read the foreword to some of these books, and um, to some of the books written by authors like them, but there are other authors. Actually, I have an easier way for you. All you have to do is use generative AI today. I've not done this, but I'm sure it would work. If you use generative AI, like ChatGPT or Claude, all you'd have to do, I think, is ask it the question, how many books written by Christian authors have forewords or endorsements by the Dalai Lama or Buddhists. And I'm sure it would give you a quality answer. I'm pretty sure it would give you a quality answer. And then you could follow up with the chat session, right? With either Claude or um, ChatGPT and ask it, can you give me a short list of books or an exhaustive list, list of books in which the forward or some part of the book was endorsed by either the Dalai Lama or a Vietnamese Buddhist, right? It just depends on how the language model was trained, if it's aware of these uh, materials, but I'm sure it would. Um, So anyway, so I was like, okay, this is where my mind went. I was like, if some of those those really good liberal Christian books are so influenced by uh, these individuals and their spiritual system, why don't I take a moment to look at that spiritual system? And so I did. I looked into it. Whereas before I may have had a passing interest, um, I started to say, oh, this is interesting. Very, very interesting. And um, I started um, acquiring more materials. And then I had, um, you know, uh, a moment um, some years back where it was like, hey, here's a book uh, you, should, you should look at um, by someone who was outside of this circle that I was in. They were, they were way outside the circle of uh, influences that I was in. And they gave me this book by Wayne Chandler. Um, this individual said he was the brother of Wayne Chandler. He gave me this book, and the title of the book was Ancient Future. He gave me a physical copy, but I don't like to hold on to anybody's physical copy if I can help it, right? So I said, I'm going to go ahead and get a digital version. And then I got the digital version and started reading in that. And while I was doing that, um, I went ahead and gave him, uh, gave, gave back to him the physical copy because I didn't want him to lose the physical copy. You know, I mean, it's his brother's book. So anyway, um, I read that book and I saw in it a, a solid summary. This is my, my feeling. This is my observation. But I saw in that book, Ancient Future, a very solid summary but not a high, not a high level summary. It had detail to it. It had substance, a good summary of all the spiritual systems. You know, not every single spiritual system, but you know the the main the major ones in terms of. It talked about African spirituality. It talked about Chinese spirituality. It talked about Japanese spirituality. It talked about Japanese. It talked about spirituality in uh, the ancient times uh, in Egypt. Um, it talked about what the Russians were doing with spirituality. Uh, it, it talked about what happened in um, Europe with spirituality. So it was able to go through all of that. It had mathematics in it. It was talking about the. It was talking about the epochs of the different ages, and it was bringing in astronomy because, you know. Long, long ago, I was an atheist, and I was an atheist because I was, um, partly because 
I had bought into the scientific establishment's view of um, spirituality. But I had changed out of that. I had read, um, what's that guy's name? Richard Dawkins? I'd read, his, I'd read several of his books, but I had read one called The God Delusion. For some strange reason, that book converted me into converted me back into Christianity because I was raised Christian. And then when I became a computer scientist, um, I, you know, started dropping. I had influences too. I, I would have managers that would, you know, refute uh, spirituality. And I didn't have any background. I didn't have enough of a background to refute what they were talking about. Um, you know, I had, I had a, I had a manager, um, you know, he, he comes from the people of the Torah, should we say, I will put it like that. He comes from the people of the Torah. And, uh, he was like, <laughs> there's no proof. And he was talking about it. There's no evidence and you can only deal with what you can see. So anyway, but anyway, um, and he was a brilliant mind when it came to, uh, computers and technology and large scale systems. But anyway, so I was kind of influenced like that. And then, you know, it was just, it was just a thing in, in uh, the science, science ish circles that I, you know, and I say science ish because it's still up for debate. Is computer science really science? But anyway, <laughs> sidebar, but, um, it's like, but something about reading Richard Dawkins work, it made me just think about things at a deeper level and slowly but surely um, it shifted me back into um, religion. I can't explain the dynamic psychologically of that, but his book, The God Delusion, uh, it was it was very, very powerful in that. It worked opposite his purpose for that. Uh, anyway, so, but the thing is, is that Fast forward, I went through an entire era in my life of Christianity where I took it so seriously that I bought movies. Um, I bought the four Gospels from Lionsgate Film. I thought it was very well done. I walked, I watched, I bought and watched an interview with God. I, I was just so into it. I, I went on a fundamentalist bent. Um, I went so out, I became an evangelist, you know? So anyway, but something about the book Ancient Future and my questions at the time and the, the linkages that I was starting to see, it, what it did is it snapped me back out of it. It just snapped me cold right out of it. I mean, I had studied exorcisms. I had studied spiritual warfare. I was, I was just so engrossed in Christianity. But when I read Ancient Future, that was it. It was like, oh, I missed something that was very important. So between that book as the catalyst for a real shift, and then I started to study shamanism, and I started to understand animism at a deeper level, and I just went on this journey where I was like, hmm, I didn't understand what I thought I understood about spirituality. And I did not. And so it was like, yeah. So anyway, so that's a insight into the same path, the same journey that many people had has decided to take because what is the big question that you hear when you're in um, religions, especially Christianity? The big question is, why are so many people leaving the church? That's the big question. Well, in this dialogue, I've actually answered it. This is the answer to that. The answer is that people want more out of their spirituality, their spiritual experience. They also want a large part of it to be supremely practical and they want it to line up they want alignment they do not want to actually witness and see or listen to leaders who are 
heads of nations. They do not want to see leaders who are heads of nations that are part of the religious community but who make political and um, executive decisions that run counter to that doctrine that they are exposed to on Sunday. They don't want to see that. It, it just uh, messes with the mind. The mind can't handle that. The mind can't handle that conflict. I'll be more specific. You can, in Christianity, make a justification for going to war. It's called the just war doctrine. I don't know if all Christian denominations believe in that, but it's called the just war doctrine. But but the thing is, the just war doctrine, it seems to go in conflict with the Ten Commandments. Thou shall not kill. People don't believe in that type of conflict. They just don't. They, they want their doctrines and they want their blueprints to line up. That's how humans are. They, they, don't like, um, they don't like things that are messy. I mean, people deal with messy things all the time. But when it comes to spirituality and religion, this is why people want to go the, spirit, the organic spiritual route or the, or the quasi-structured spiritual route. Because they're seeking things that line up. And it's a, and those are spiritual paths that are more under their control, right? Under the control of the masses. They can control that spirituality, right? And at the same time, they want to see practical application in their life. So the, the um, discussions around manifestation speaking things into existence, positive affirmation about using crystals, using singing bowls, using mala beads and chanting mantras. Those are actual actions. Those are actions, right? There are things that you can say, okay, I can go get me some crystals, get some knowledge. I can go get me um, the, the right type of um, attire and equipment and or whatever and get some knowledge and get some guidance and I can I can actually take action with spirituality to this world rather than just say I'm just going to hope it all away and hope that everything will be okay and that sort of thing um that that's 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 the type of message that can be okay for a season but it's not okay for a lifetime for many people and so hey you know, it is what it is. It is what it is, right? Uh, people want to see benefit in the things that they do. They don't want to waste their time, right? And so I know this is kind of screeching on the chalkboard for those that are in the priesthood or in the diaconate or, you know, or in other, um, you know, um, hallowed positions in um, the, the religious world. And I do apologize for that. And it was not none of this is meant to be a critique on you for choosing a certain path or any of that. It's simply an observation and a statement of the reality as many people have come to see it. And I know that there has been many attempts to try to turn that around and, you know... Um, I mean, uh, th this is not this is not a surprise. Depending on how high up in a religious hierarchy, I was in a meeting one time with a monsignor, right? I was in a meeting. It was, it was actually a class. It was a class. Uh, yeah, it was on Revelations. Uh, the monsignor, he was like almost seventy or something like that. Um, I've known him for a long time, and he was just addressing the group, and he said. Hey, back in the day, I'm, I'm paraphrasing because, I, you know, his exact sentences I don't have memorized. I just know what he was saying. He said back in the day, being a Christian was very, very popular thing to do. And he was just very upfront. He was like, there's going to come a time real soon where 
it's not going to be popular to be a Christian. And um, he said some other things about that where he's like, yeah, you could be outside of society if you wasn't a Christian, but he was, he was making the implication that the reverse will be true. He was very wise and very, uh, he didn't operate under delusions. He was very hardcore with knowing what a situation is. And I greatly respected and admired him for his clear thinking, you know, on a range of things. And so anyway, and he just verbalized what I, what I already knew. I, I was just sitting there in my mind. I didn't do this outwardly. I mean, it's not appropriate to do that in a situation like that. But inwardly, I was just clapping my hands like, that brother right there is telling it like it is. But anyway, um, but yeah, so many already know this. But what I've done is I've explained here what that is how this has developed. Now, let's transition into the final part. The final part of this is that what is spirituality now and in the foreseeable future? When we say foreseeable, we mean maybe the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, right? We're not checking into 100 years from now. But in the more, more recent time, next five to ten years, what in the foreseeable future is spirituality? So spirituality, as we are experiencing it now, what we call woke, right? Because, listen, some people are using woke as a political term. There is fine for them to do that. But the people that know what woke really is, um, they're, they're not distracted by that for the most part. You know, you can use woke to say, oh, it's all about these social issues, right? Um, okay, maybe that is one definition of woke where you're, you're waking up to the idea that uh, some of the narratives around identity, around community, around nationalism has been a fabrication, has been false. See, when you wake up, so what woke means, right, whether you like it or not, is that you have now seen the truth. You now see the truth, okay? Now, some people who hold to a different narrative that those who believe they have woken up uh, believe is that, so those that hold to a narrative that they believe is true, when they see others who no longer embrace that narrative, they think that those people who are woken up are now living a lie, right? It's just a conflict psychologically. You, and in many cases, you can't resolve it unless you're a master of um, diplomacy and uh, mending uh, differences and building bridges and that sort of thing. Unless you're a master of that, and we haven't seen very many of those individuals here in this time frame, like they were in the 1960s and 70s, right? Before many of those people got assassinated, right? But, you know, you just don't see um, that type of type of individual in today's... You, you don't have a Jeffrey Sachs, for example, on every street corner uh, or every institution mending those, those differences and building those bridges, whatever, right? So in the absence of that, you've got this polarization. You've got these clashes, right? Because you don't have true adult-level referees that keep the society from imploding in the argument and the shouting match. All right, so then, you know, that's, what, that's where we are here in the foreseeable future is that people are more empowered now with information. They're more empowered now to... And see here, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. That genie is out. Somebody has rubbed the lamp and out through the, the, the neck of the lamp has come out the smoke of this, 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 uh, this awareness. Even if you destroyed all social media, if that was even possible, but it's not actually. But even if you destroyed all of that, it's too late. You have, a, you have inertia now. It's its own rhythm that exists in the real world. See, 
social media may be the may have been a, a huge a, a huge catalyst for a larger number of people because you had people like me if you listen to what I have said if you've listened to what I have said I am like a, a multitude of people who were not influenced by social media my awakening happened in a more traditional way I'm a traditional woke person, right? And so traditional woke people were in a minority and had to be quiet and could only uh, find fulfillment in their wokeness by reading books and having um, confidential conversations with individuals of like mind. And if you go even further back in the past, this is why you have the Illuminati, or you had the Illuminati and others, because you know there was a great there's a great book called the Perfectibilist that actually chronicled in a very scholarly way, not in a sensational uh, Dan Brown kind of way. I'm talking about an academic scholarly book. It's called the Perfectibilist. It's thick. Um, it, not everybody's going to read it. I don't think, but anyway, it, it showed how it was so unpopular to have the discussion I'm having on this particular discussion here. Man, you could, you, could, you could lose your life. You could lose everything. So you had groups of people. They built a society. See, I don't even, I no longer look at the Illuminati with the type of, um, uh, what do you call that, um, Fear, well, I never actually feared it, but you know, I just, but I don't look at it with the same type of um, criticism, right? Or disdain that people, you'll, you'll see all these uh, videos about the Illuminati. People don't even know what the Illuminati is. They were people that were trying to be free in their mind and their thoughts. It's not a worldwide conspiracy to do this or that, okay? Those who are woke today would be considered Illuminati back in the day. That's the point blank truth. And I'll save you having to read a thousands of pages of scholarly materials on that. That's really what it is. Okay? If you if you are in somebody's crib, somebody's house, and y'all having drinks, and by the way, I've never uh, drank any liquor or alcohol. I've never smoked, and I was celibate for over 18 years. So, anyway... But I'm just using this as a, an analogy. Um, but if you've hung out at somebody's house and you all, you know, uh, drank drank some some good some good stuff and you smoked some good stuff, right? And you just um, let your inhibitions down and you told each other about the world the way it is. That's essentially, you know, what your lodges and your groups were back in the day. Okay. All right, and they were like, hey, these are some good ideas. Why should they be suppressed in the name of uh, religious expediency? That was their thing. That was their thing. Okay, all right. So, so that's the world that I come from in terms of, you know, I just wanted to figure things out. That's all I was trying to do was just figure things out. And my conclusions led me to where I am today, right? If you look at my videos and uh, discussions the past two years, and you look at my blog posts, right? I ended up where I ended up to just do the scholarly research, the old school way, as they would say, okay? So you were never ever going to uh, get rid of wokeness it was just uh, regulated on the basis of the amount of effort it took to get there, right? But now we don't have, now we have a frictionless way of getting there. That's why I scroll social media so much now, because there's so much I want to read, so much I want to study, but it would, it would take decades to get through all the type of books I want to read. So I took a shortcut, right, 2021, I'm telling you what, I got on uh, I got on that social media and it was like, okay. 
look at the look at the acceleration I can go through. So I I put the books down. I stopped reading all these books. Right. I still got this library, but it's like, yeah, I'm just gonna stop all of this, and I'm just gonna hear it directly from the 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 uh, the best minds themselves. So that's how I went on that. So that's why I have insight now on social media, whereas previously I did not. Is that what we see in the foreseeable future is people getting so much information about this that this has already happened. It's already happened. But you have waves and waves and waves and generations of people. Their knowledge is at a level now. They are far beyond even your mid-level religious scholars. Let me say that again. You can, you can, you can now try to go and get a PhD in um, theological studies and divinity. You can do that, right? You, you know, and whatever it is in the um, Islamic equivalent, you can go do all of that. But I tell you, there are people now. And I'm not talking about the what they would call the lay people at large, but the more the more earnest students, their scholarship in terms of the practical application of spirituality into the third dimensional realm is so far above and so far where a traditional scholar can get to if they even spent their entire life trying to get that knowledge. So then you got those type of people, those advanced ones, disseminating this information out to the lay people who are actually more read. I'm not talking about read as in they've read books. I'm talking about read as in they are more knowledgeable about spirituality than the average lay person in religion. So what are you going to do? You can't, you can't reverse that now because you, you have... And this is not an exaggerated number because you know how social media works. There are, listen, even with the restrictions in China, you got all the people, they're they're able to get access to some some information, right? You got over a billion people in China. Got over a billion people in India. They they, they access social media. Why do you think Satguru has um, nearly two to four billion views across all of his YouTube videos. Why is that? Right? Because some of that is from India, which has over a billion people, but it's also um, the combined total of the other parts of the world, right? That has over a billion people. And then you got Africa, which has over a billion people. And, you know, there's a large at uh, amount, of, a large area in Africa that doesn't, still today have the, the access to social media, but there's a lot of Africans that do. There's a lot of people in South America, what we call South America. They have access to social media. So what I'm saying is you have hundreds of millions of people that have been exposed to spiritual knowledge. If you are honest and you are someone that can take honest information like what I'm giving you right now, if you're the type of religious leader in a traditional religious modality that can take the type of clear-headed review and analysis I am sharing, if you look at the numbers based on social media exposure, we know how addictive TikTok is, right? I don't do TikTok. I can't stand it. But anyway, you know, I, I guess I'm just saying, I have TikTok immunity. I just don't like that stuff. Anyway, but I get exposed to it because I have relatives that love it. And they say, hey, I'm going to show you this TikTok. And I'm going to watch it for their sake. And I ain't going to watch what comes next, you know. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to comment on it. I only do that for relatives and friends, right? But I don't go on TikTok. I think I got a TikTok account, but I'm not sure. I, I just don't, I don't spend a second on TikTok unless somebody sends it to me. Okay, um, but anyway, but I know about the statistics on TikTok. Millions of people. 
and they've been they've been exposed to veganism, vegetarianism, okay, but also carniv carnivorism and paleo. And whatever. They've been exposed to holistic living. They've been exposed to commentary on governments and what they've actually done. Um, Julian Assange's information is out there. Er Edward Snowden's information is out there, but also all the spiritual information is out there. And RFK Jr. is doing very well out in the uh, social media sphere, okay? So you can't put the genie back in the bottle because even if you shut down all of these avenues of information, just guess what? <laughs> People got like shops and uh, businesses, brick and mortar businesses in places like Atlanta and Detroit and everywhere. This stuff is out there and they'll just like, it just you just be cutting ahead on Hydra, and you'll you'll spring up like ten more. It'll just keep going and keep going and keep going. It's already going. It's already trying to do that, right? So, um, so there's no going back, and so, um, and it's not that I'm trying to help religion, but if religion was to go forward into what we call the 21st century. You're looking at a mass and substantial reformation of at least Christianity. Because I think Islam is immune to, to reformation, I'm just saying. But Christianity, um, I think, would have to go undergo a massive reformation. Because, and I could be wrong, and it's okay for me to be wrong. But it just looks like... Traditional conservative Christianity is not going to survive except under what you would call uh, a heavy funding from um, a, a wing of the oligarchic state or a heavy technocratic, I'm not technocratic, a heavy theocratic um, direction under uh, pol uh, political crisis um, in the Western nations, right? Those are only scenarios where that would, but it's like, but still, it's like, uh, what what good is that's going to do? Because you're you're still um, pursuing that under the larger um, um, and predictable predictable um, uh, transition into a revolutionary um, uh, era, a re a revolutionary era, right? A revolution is inevitable. Right, it's just um, what form is it going to take? How bloody is it going to be? How extensive it's going to be, and so on and so forth. And then, yeah, um, just looking at human nature and looking at history, yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, Christianity will survive just like Taoism survived in some form. I mean, it's not as big as it used to be, just like Confucianism evolved. Right, it's it's almost. Uh, transparent now. There's no, there's no explicit Confucianism uh, that I see or observe from afar. Looking at China, I don't see explicit Confucianism, but I see the 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 spirit of Confucius in today's China. Right? It's like you will see the spirit of Christianity in whatever future form the United States and the United Kingdom takes. Right? You'll see the spirit Spirit of Christianity in terms of you know how British common law and its cousin in its evolved state in the United States uh, will man continue to manifest for as long as you have the quote unquote um, Western European style approach to governance and society on the co the North American continent, for example, right? But in terms of the actual flavor and the day-to-day -day experience of, of these religions, right? Um, you can see it like becoming much more aligned with the political and social sensibilities and tastes of the people. You can see it. And that flavor is liberal, inclusive, and collective and the oligarchic state at large is largely indifferent to that doesn't care 
the oligarchic state is not theocratic. It's it is um, it is actually the religion of the oligarchic state is mercantilism, right? So as long as it's going to make money and prop up the money, um, whatever it it whether it's physical currency, digital currency, or some hybrid in between, whatever. The oligarchic state just wants to know where its money at. They don't care about all of that other stuff. They don't care about social issues. It doesn't care about religion. It doesn't care about spirituality. It doesn't care about woke. What's the money opportunity? Can I t- can I can I tap into traditional Christianity and make some money? Can I track? Can I tap into uh, social justice and make some money? That's just how the oligarchic state operates. That's how the corporatocracy operates. Okay? That's just the, the reality. But the people as... I don't like the word consumer. I can't, I can't, really, I can't actually stand that word. But the people as um, buyers, as people, the people as persons who buy things and who prefer to buy things that come packaged in certain ways, those people are going to influence the way that goods and services and spaces that people uh, eat at and and shop at and so on and so forth, they're going to influence how that is represented. And it's going to be represented based on this woke, liberal uh, sensibility. You know, and I, I don't actually have a judgment on that in this discussion. It would, it, would, it would take this discussion and make it twice as long as it, you know, as it is. We don't want to do that right now, right? We want to stay focused in what we're talking about. So, so it's going to take on that flavor, right? And um, that's just is what it is. And so the thing is for Christianity to actually have a second birth or a third birth, or whatever, you know. Um, you, could, you could technically say the second birth of uh, Christianity was during the Council of Nicaea in the, um, in the 15th century, I believe. Yeah, so the Council of Nicaea, right, if I got my, my time frames right, but that would, I would, I classify that as the second birth of Christianity. And, um, and then I would say that the um, fall of the the Roman Empire and the transition of power in terms of like the titular head of the Western world um, into the uh, the pontificate uh, would be the third uh, birth of Christianity, right? And then that was that was long lived, and then you had a fourth rebirthing of Christianity, right? With micro milestones, you could talk about uh, Ignatius um, and uh, what he accomplished. But I would say the fourth real one was uh, Martin Luther and the Reformation, right? And we can go on from that, right? We can go on and on and on, right? So, but. If we're talking about grand rebirths, right? I would say that the next grand rebirth of Christianity, if there is to be one, unless it's just to become like Taoism and some of these other practices where it becomes more a philosophical footnote, right? And I know uh, Pope Francis said, yes, religion is not a, a philosophy, but, it, but I say it will become, any religion will become philosophy when it becomes less active among a larger group of people, right? It becomes philo- philo- philosophy. You know, you can view Taoism as a religion, but is it really an active religion? My answer is no. It is now viewed today and approached today um, more on a philosophical basis and a, an inspiration for spiritual, spiritual insight more so than an actual Religion, even though there are people that are trying to um, uh, experience it that way, so it's the same with Christianity. That it's you know, 
its ability to embrace the the norms and the mores uh, to uh, draw from Richard Dawkins again uh, to embrace that right. Um, what I of course uh, I think I'm I'm speaking more of. Um, Meme. I believe Richard Dawkins created the term meme. But anyway, it doesn't matter. So, but for religion to actually embrace that, right? To embrace what is actually happening um, is going to be the way that it um, actually uh, continues to endure, right? Without great conflict and bloodshed, etc., etc., etc. Otherwise, yeah, it's just going to become a philosophy. But that takes us to um, my final conclusion, okay? And then I'm going to wrap this up. My final conclusion is this. Everything that I said is true from my point of view, but I have a point of view that, that um, people who follow an organic spiritual path or a woke, um, semi-structured spiritual path may find somewhat disagreeable. And I do apologize for that, but I do not apologize for my conclusion. And that is that... Uh, this woke movement and th- the way spirituality is being pursued, uh, it has the flavor of religion. I'm seeing it. You know, it, it's in some ways it's inevitable because if you if you study some of the scholarly works on past spiritual movements, some of the best teachers of spirituality have often admitted that religion is an attempt to capture something that was so profound and special. And it can never do that, or at least do it long term. But that's where religions uh, are born, is from that profound, uh, phenomenal and profound experience, spiritual experience, that then there's an attempt to codify it at some point. And there's still some power left in that. There's still some power left in that. But it starts to diminish over time. And as the, the amount of time lengthens, it diminishes more and more until, um, you know, in some cases, corruption sets in. In some cases, it simply calcifies into something that is on the edge of being dead and no longer a vibrant source of life and rejuvenation or a real catalyst for evolution of a more profound kind. And so we see many um, social media outlets, channels, you might say, uh, people tuning in, and there are business opportunities associated with it, right? And there's nothing wrong with that in many cases. But you see this amassing of individuals, right, around personalities. And the personalities don't intend to become a religious figure, but it's inevitable for some. It's, it's inevitable. And if there is to be a miracle in spirituality and wokeness in terms of maintaining authenticity and truth for people, the only miracle that I could see happening, if there is to be one, is for people to, in great, great numbers, to stay disengaged from personality, but to actually tap into their own journey, whether that's through the organic path or semi-structured paths like Buddhism, Taoism, and others, right? And so, you know, there you are. So um, if you found this to be interesting, uh, like this um, discussion. Just go ahead and like it so others can have more of an opportunity to, you know, um, avail themselves of this. Uh, like, like it, you know. Um, and if you have some comments, you know, if this, if you, you know, I, I welcome the comments. Um, I've gotten much better about my social media etiquette. So um, we don't do debates. I I avoid debates as much as possible. Um, I'm going to try to point you to, you know, directions where I've I've gotten uh, inspiration. I'm I'm going to keep it light and positive, right? 
And so, and if I don't respond to you immediately, it's uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I got to go to work, <laughs> you know, because I work a, I work a regular job, so um, I, I have to um, exercise discipline on when I can actually review and respond to comments because I don't like to respond to comments uh, rashly or hur- uh, hurriedly. I like to take my time and digest what has been said and give back um, a quality response as much as possible. So, you know, that may mean that it may be a few days before I respond back to you if you make a comment um, because um, I want to make sure that time is right, that, you know, I'm not rushed um, and that, um, you know, um, I've had time to uh, relax after a long day of work and, you know, maybe I don't have uh, the time um, after work to do it. So I have to wait for a day off, right? Like the weekend or some other time, right? But I am going to get to your comment because, um, you know, this particular medium won't let me forget anyway. I mean, your, your comment will be sitting there until I respond to it, right? So um, I will be reminded to respond to what you um, express. And so I will express um, a response, right? Um, the other reason why I may not respond immediately is because um, I, may, uh, I may need to wait for um, other people to give them the opportunity to, to respond. I, I, sometimes when the, the publisher of information uh, responds, it, it, can, it can silence, unintentionally silence others from responding, right? And so um, I want to just give it a little bit more breathing time for others to, to uh, share their, their conclusions and, and, um, and weigh in. But I usually don't let a week pass uh, before uh, responding. So um, you'll usually get a response in about uh, two to three days on average if you make a comment. So I look forward to hearing from anyone. And again, like uh, the video if, if you thought it was a quality, whether you agreed with it or not. I've learned that likes are not about what you agree with necessarily, but likes is more about is it uh, something that um, is of quality and where um, the effort was put into it. So I hope to hear from you, uh, either through likes or through comments, and um, uh, keep well with your life, and um, I will see you later.